You're on YouTube? I think there's. Hey. Don't think you can go start though, but yet I don't Yeah, yes. Still more to come. As well. <laughs> Nothing I have a I saw we have someone on the desk. I know, I just put me in my eyes. I just yeah, All right, um, let's at least get started with the first steps. Uh, welcome back to the center. It's it, it's pretty much supposed to be the second time we're meeting, but uh, uh, last uh, uh, week, last week, Nick Rescher, our dear chairman, was unable to give his uh, beginning of the semester usual lecture. Uh, you're very sorry about it. Fine, it's no issue with him, but uh, issues with the family. So uh, uh, we hope to uh, maybe see him this semester or for sure next next semester. Uh, let, before introducing our speaker, let me remind you about the events in the coming days and weeks. On Friday, there is no lunchtime talk. However, there's an, the first annual lecture series talk given by Doreen Fraser who is also uh, the Adult Green Bar Memorial Lecturer this, this year. So her talk is at 3.30 p.m. on the 10th floor in close of your physics, of course. On uh, Tuesday, so the second lunch, lunchtime talk this semester, and uh, Raquel Krempel, who is somewhere here, uh, she's right there, uh, who has been with us for a year. She's a postdoctoral at, uh, at the center coming from Brazil, and she will be talking about aphantasia. If you don't know what aphantasia is, it's one of the most interesting conditions. People, uh, psychiatric condition or psychiatric, psychological condition, people who can't imagine things. It's really a curious thing. They can't have visual imagery, they can't have auditory imagery. It's an interesting feature. So she'll be talking a bit about its significance for inner speech and conscious thinking. So we, we'll be uh, hearing about that next uh, Tuesday. And the next conference, or the first conference of the semester at the center is taking place on October 8 and uh, 9. Uh, and it's organized by uh, Kevin Dorst, formerly from the philosophy department now at MIT, Kevin, Z Kevin Zellman at CMU, and Josh Noob at uh, Yale. And it's going to bring together people who do uh, formal work in philosophy and experimental work in philosophy. And uh, if you're invited, please send us an email. If you're interested, please send us an email. Uh, we would like to see uh, uh, many of you at uh, this conference. 
Today, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce or reintroduce uh, Ingo Brigand, who uh, many of you uh, know, I mean, as you probably many of you know, Ingo got his PhD here at Elite in 2006. So we very briefly overlap when I started my, my job. Uh, which was really quite wonderful. Uh, it's a department of history and philosophy of science. Ingo is a philosopher of uh, biology, but also had a lot of interest in general, general history and philosophy of science. It's published widely in both uh, fields in the philosophy of biology on, on Evo Devo, on concept of evolutionary novelty, on, and on a range of different concepts. In philosophy of science on issues about scientific concepts, on issues about explanation also, and a range of different concepts. He's a professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Alberta. He's also the Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of Biology since 2014. And uh, I think it can only be renewed once. Is it yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, One and a half more years, or two, nearly two, okay. two, year, two more years. Yeah. Um, um, he's been a visiting fellow at the center in 2019, and he's again a visiting fellow this year, and we're really happy to uh, to have you in the week. Unfortunately, only this fall, not this year. No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, you're going to be talking about gender and values at the intersection of molecular biology. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, it's always great to be back in uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah. So. Okay, so the um, basic topic of my talk um, are different uh, methodologies in the domain of human behavior and cognition research with a focus on methodologies that may either promote or um, hinder integration. And my talk has three parts. In the first part, um, I will use Longinus rejection of the very possibility of integration in this domain as a kind of motivation for uh, taking a different um, perspective first um, to reveal a kind of more fine-grained and diverse methodological landscape than Don Gino does, and a second to kind of refocus the um, debate on uh, the normative desirability of integration. And then the second talk I tackle with a kind of former um, issue. My case study will be at the intersection of epigenetics and uh, psychiatry. We'll see the actual kind of um, we find uh, quite different um, methodological commitments that have different implications for um, integration. And in the third part, uh, uh, part, I look at gender issues in this domain and I will highlight social political reasons for having, uh, for wanting more um, integration. So that's the um, roadmap. Um, so Helen Longino in her 2013 um, book studying human behavior uh, mapped out um, the overall meth methodological landscape of the uh, domain by breaking it into different approaches. So quantitative behavior genetics, molecular behavior genetics, uh, social environmental approaches are different approaches on her account. My focus will be on the nexus between primarily molecular and social environmental um, approaches. Uh, but in contrast to me, Longino actually argues in her book um, that there's no possibility of establishing any integrative relations across any of these um, approaches because of different methodologies um, create incommensibilities among the approaches. Um, in a nutshell, um, her kind of um, idea is uh, of what she kind of views like a primary methodological driver. The idea is that um, different approaches um, pass the total space of causes um, differently resulting in consumability. Um, however, I want, don't want to kind of deal um, too much with the kind of actual um, arguments. You see the kind of a second um, a why I kind of rather want to kind of um, 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 use this of exchange as a kind of motivation to take a quite different uh, perspective or look at different things than Longino uh, does. So um, in her account, um, Helen, um, um, explicitly reject Sandy Mitchell's um, integrative pluralism. Sandy's, Sandy's room here. So um, I'll be talking about it, but you can later on see whether a kind of more nuanced assessment um, is uh, needed. And curiously, Longino doesn't cite any other um, pre-2013 literature when she, her book came out on integration or interdisciplinarity. In fact, um, she just cites um, Sandy's 
paper on integrative uh, uh, um, um, pluralism, not the kind of book that came out along the, the same time. Um, she doesn't even cite um, Sandy's 2009 Uncivil Truth book, even though it touches on um, human behavior and cognition um, exam, um, e um, examples. And I, I'm not going to kind of um, um, capture all this literature. If you want to kind of a sense of it, check out um, Alan Laugh and Mai, a Stanford Encyclopedia entry on re um, uh, reductionism in biology. The last part, we present all the recent literature on integration as a kind of main contemporary alternative to old um, reduction. Um, that SCP entry came out in 2008. Every few years we've been updating it, and the main update has been to add even more and more of the literature. But in 2012, um, when Longino was writing, um, see kind of how much literature was already kind of out, um, out there. In a nutshell, all these accounts are brought in line with the Sandys um, uh, vision. So the idea is that integration um, is somehow the kind of coordination of different intellectual resources, typically coming from different um, uh, fields, so it also aligns with um, um, interdisciplinarity. Um, Longino, um, however, in her book, um, actually misconstrues integration as the kind of view that you could merge all models in a domain into kind of one. And I'll sort of just show this by some throwing out some quotes. She says, Mitchell is guided by monist intuitions, one system, one complete model, integrating a multiple processes. Can I just say that's just completely misreading everything I've ever written about it? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'll let you go. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I was to get to that, but um, actually it's not just misreading everything you have written, but um, misreading all of the literature um, regardless of whether she actually is, is aware of all of this, because it's, it's impossible to tell she doesn't have cited. Or kind of another um, um, a good, good example is she, she presents her alternative to kind of a vision like a Sandy's. The alleged alternative is we can learn more about the system by utilize, utilizing multiple partial representations. And that's exactly multiple partial mm -hmm. is exactly Sandy's view. So I take it as most explicit in her kind of more recent book on protein folding, but it was already kind of expressed in the kind of two earlier books that Longino um, um, was published before Longino was um, uh, writing. And likewise, she claims that integration proponents see plurality as eventually um, um, eliminable. Of course, no one, no one says so. Of course, she doesn't cite or mention anyone. She does sort of has all these labels um, um, and Makes sense. So, so, it's, um, so at the end of the day, I think uh, because of this, I don't think sort of um, approaching, sort of engaging with the kind of philosophical um, framework in her book is not, or the argument is not the most fruitful part. I mean, it's much more interesting to actually get into the chapter in her book that's where she kind of discusses a different approach and see how human behavior science works. So that's something where we can get something out of the um book so but i want to kind of use this as kind of motivation to something else but um likewise um uh, relevant is there have been um, direct critical responses and effectively claiming that integration isn't just possible which would only kind of contradict her claim but of integration has happened and the two instances um I'm aware of directly responding uh, to long you know, is a uh, jim tabri's beyond versus book um so he's also an hbs Right. So kind of good stuff is coming out of this department, I guess. Yeah. So he's interested in the traditional gap between um, uh, quantitative genetics and social environmental um, approaches. And he only kind of points to kind of an existing research that sort of partially bridge that uh, gap. Likewise, Katie Plaisons um, has engaged in collaborative research with a um, psychologist at her um, uh, institution. And in addition to the kind of um, co-authored papers in scientific uh, venues, she gave a talk at the last PSA where she directly kind of pointed, um, directly engaged with Longino and pointed to this work as sort of a counter example. So Jim and Katie are perfectly right. Um, however, um, one does have to grant that sort of, um, they can only point to kind of some, uh, certainly not kind of mainstream or not certainly approaches that will dominate um, the, the field. So kind of pointing to kind of isolated examples of integration. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, that's 
debunks Longino, yeah, but of course one has to grant that um, integration isn't um, isn't easy yeah, or kind of prevalent. And so by implication, um, the alternative perspective I want to adopt is to kind of um, of a kind of much more fine-grained uh, methodological assessment because note that what Longino effectively does, she um, takes one field and assumes a field has one approach because molecular genetics is a field, um, quantitative genetics is a field, but she just dubs them as approach or presents them having kind of one overarching um, approach. In contrast, my alternative philosophical um, um, method, so to speak, is to kind of um, investigate and reveal individual methodological um, and explanatory stances, several of which can be adopted by a research group. And some of these um, stances may conflict. And so you do have diversity within the field, or you do have methodological diversity within what Longino kind of makes out as kind of one big um, approach. And sometimes these individual stances can also reinforce each other, including reinforcing each other to kind of um, hamper um, integration, which sounds sort of I mean, in line with a lot of Longino's uh, vision, but that's sort of um, something it's not on her radar because she assumes there's sort of one big methodological field passing cause and spaces that a one methodological factor that sort of deterministically creates incompatibility. So she doesn't even have it on her radar that um, individual sciences could reinforce each other to kind of um, um, hamper integration. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, using this framework, you can may well be uh, may well be possible to kind of point to uh, some at least some research in the field who already adopt methodological stances that permit um, integration of their work with the work of other uh, fields. And the um, second um, shift in perspective is to get to kind of um, um, uh, normative normativity, because when Longino uh, is skeptical about integration, um, this is just a kind of descriptive uh, claim and impossibility claim um, based on kind of how she views uh, uh, contemporary uh, human behavior research. Um, that said, even though sort of just a descriptive tenet, adopting this vision um, has a kind of side effect of uh, discouraging, discouraging any integrative um, efforts. In contrast, I want to kind of um, point to kind of normative reasons for more integration in between molecular and social environmental uh, researchers, research for reasons such as improving human health and reducing social inequity. And um, given that, um, given that there are sort of some methodological uh, factors that um, benefit such desirable integration, we ought to kind of uh, foster it. And this, at the same time, there are also kind of alternative methodological um, commitments that may be disadvantageous, so we sort of critically engage with that. And that actually um, uh, permits me to kind of um, um, connect this up to kind of Helen Longino's earlier work on the um, importance of transformative criticism within scientific uh, com community. Yeah. I'm curiously in her 2013 book, she does not comment on this earlier work of hers and effectively given her incompatibility um, uh, position, at least sort of incompatibility between approaches, um, she kind of, um, she's sort of barred from um, kind of uh, using kind of her earlier um, ideas in this uh, case. And in what was follows, my case study will be at the intersection of epigenetics as a kind of a very um, molecular approach and a neuro uh, psychiatry and especially kind of role of social environmental factors on uh, human uh, cognition. And as we will see, they're actually kind of mis mixed prospects for the promises for more integration. But these um, uh, mixed prospects also kind of underscore why it's um, relevant to kind of refocus instead on uh, normative um, co uh, considerations. Okay, on to the second part of um, my talk. Um, let's start with a quick uh, primer on behavioral epigenetics. So there are kind of two types of, or two main types of um, epigenetic modifications, DNA methylation and histone modification. They're called epigenetic um, because these changes don't change the linear DNA sequence. And so you don't get a kind of different uh, gene product uh, from a gene, but uh, these epigenetic uh, marks, they impact the regulation of the nearby um, um, a, a gene and thereby have a kind of um, influence. Um, these epigenetic modifications are kind of due to kind of some um, factor signaling outside 
of uh, the cell. Um, epigenetic uh, modifications uh, can be inherited across somatic cell um, divisions, but they also occur in mature neurons, which don't, di don't, um, don't divide. So even though these um, changes aren't inherited, they're still relevant because um, these epigenetic changes modify the activity in these uh, neuron. And um, it's of a well-known, among other things, due to kind of a model organism research on rodents, um, but also do um, um, non-intervention studies in uh, humans um, or kind of post-mortem um, studies that there are epigenetic modifications that can be specific to kind of brain regions or um, um, uh, tissues. I mean, you have epigenetic modifications anywhere in the body, but my focus is on uh, behavior. And these um, uh, modifications can in impact neuronal plasticity, memory, and um, learning. And to mention, um, a kind of relevant example, um, well, example relevant to neuropsychiatric uh, condition. Um, so the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, um, is a kind of locus of um, research. It involves part inside and outside of the brain. The HPA axis is um, involved in how organisms respond to stress. In the case of human um, changes in the HPA axis, are kind of um, processing there is involved with different um, mood um, disorders. And more generally, um, there, now we have sort of evidence for the involvement of epigenetic mechanisms in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, major depression, po post-traumatic stress syndrome, anorexia, and uh, substance um, abuse. Okay, so what matters to the kind of integration um, I'm kind of con I'm concerned with our sort of methodological visions that um, are kind of open to aligning epigenetic as a kind of molecular research with the kind of role of um, the environmental factor, in fact, especially the kind of human um, environment. And one thing facilitating this is sort of nowadays um, we know that the epigenetic of a, a state of a cell. Um, is dynamic and re reversible. So in the case that once an epigenetic mark is set up, it cannot be um, reversed. And this um, happens in response to cells or organisms environment. Kind of classical case is the switching um, back and forth between honeybee behavioral subcasts due to kind of nutrition they um, uh, receive. And this kind of vision of epigenetics state as being um, a dynamic and re respond to the environment uh, responding to the environment has also made its way into um, behavioral epigenetics, um, uh, where sort of some of the researchers, for instance, uphold um, epigenetics um, as a kind of mechanism for shedding light on gene environment um, um, interactions and they want to actively investigate gene environment interaction. Because obviously, the, there are gene environment interactions, um, but of course, what are the kind of there's many mechanistic intermediate uh, steps, and so they kind of um, use epigenetics as kind of one additional. Um, ingredient to kind of fill that um, uh, picture. Um, likewise, um, schizophrenia a few decades ago used to be largely um, a genetic, um, but now among the kind of psychiatric conditions, maybe the best case we have for the involvement of epigenetics, um, epigenetic processes. So in line with this, you have sort of researchers um, stating that the kind of boundary between environmental and heritable risks for mental disorders is far less clear cut than is currently recognized. So you do have researchers that use the molecular approach to epigenetics to investigate sort of neuronal plasticity and the kind of role of the uh, human environment, including on neuropsychiatric uh, symptom uh, formation. And to kind of mention um, uh, some um, examples of taking seriously the role of the social environment, you have a field called environmental epigenetics. To be sure, there the kind of primary um, factors are nutrition and pollutants, how they impact um, um, us. Um, but sort of one generally um, um, social category that has been used in these epidemiological studies is to kind of investigating the role of socioeconomic status. Closer to my case um, of um, the intersection of neuropsychiatry and um, epigenetics. Epigenetics studies have kind of pointed um, to the role of different social, um, social uh, conditions or kind of human experience, including maternal stress, childhood abuse, traumatic events, age and, um, mm -hmm. age and gender. And effectively, the 
kind of integration that you may kind of already see or these of the integrative efforts you have aligns with the kind of uh, vision of those upholding uh, mechanism i take it off not all integration can just be captured by talking about a mechanism because you have epidemiological models i mean there are other kind of more broader accounts uh, saying the integration is um one field the result of one field becoming relevant to another one um but um um where the kind of mechanistic um, accounts are um, right is sort of emphasized. Um, you have a sort of multi-level research of different disciplines, may kind of shed light on aspects on different levels of organization and try to connect them up. And of course, you have sort of multi-field integration that is sort of as all mechanistic research is is an ever increasing and in uh, ongoing um, and affair. And to kind of mention an example on my case, um, one uh, the approach by or the account by Morgan and Hutchinson on psychosis. They already use a kind of integrative framework. They include such features as dopamine and the HPA axis, gene and environment interaction, and in addition to kind of more uh, molecular neurophysiological stuff, they also kind of emphasize the role of um, cognitive and emotive or effective uh, processes for um, uh, psych um, uh, psychosis. So they don't mention um, epigenetics um, um, research, but this only existing integrative um, uh, framework may well be kind of point of contact for epigenetics research to kind of um, tie into existing um, existing findings, because as I've mentioned, the HPA axis um, has only been a locus of where epigenetics researchers have contributed um, to this. Okay, but in addition to kind of researchers being open to kind of integrate epigenetics work with all of um, the role of the social human environment, um, you do have um, um, obstacles. And so kind of one um, example is that at least sort of researchers in sort of traditional areas of epigenetics like X chromosome epi I mean, activation, they uh, may well be sort of um, skeptical towards uh, behavioral epigenetics people because they feel that they um, call um, anything that somehow affects gene regulation as epigenetic, regardless of whether, strictly speaking, DNA, um, 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 DNA methylation or histone um, modification. And this may not just be kind of a quibble about sort of how we refine the label um, epigenetic, but it may well kind of um, signal a kind of a, a stance where these researchers just want to um, want to kind of restrictly investigate only those causes they deemed to be uh, epigenetic. And of course, you take this narrow vision, um, you kind of must much less likely kind of see how kind of the uh, um, environmental factors by kind of very complex uh, mechanistic um, uh, processes actually kind of impact gene um, regulation. Um, likewise, um, maybe in the future, we can use epigenetics research to um, uh, develop therapeutic um, intervention. There are some epigenetics research I kind of point out that we may be able to develop um, psychotherapeutic um, interventions. The idea being kind of once we have an understanding of human um, behavior experiences and social environments, um, uh, uh, um, generate certain epigenetic modification that lead to uh, psychiatric uh, symptoms, we can develop preventive um, uh, measures or behavioral um, uh, treatments. Um, but it may well be possible that the kind of majority of the field will instead um, capitalize and pursue um, pharmacological treatments um, to kind of reverse and modify epigenetic marks. If all that you're doing, then all you need to know is sort of um, which epigenetic modification creates symptoms, how to kind of um, um, get rid of um, them, but you don't have to investigate how would these epigenetic changes were kind of set up in the first place due to um, the person's um, life, life experiences. And finally, um, this is not new. Um, others have, um, philosophers, historians, sociologists of science have already pointed um, out that in, at least in some corners of the epigenetics community, you find a kind of surprisingly deterministic this course, because epigenetics about the environment, it's very opposite of genetic determinism, it seems, uh, but there's a talk of um, um, epigenetic uh, programming, where sometimes the idea is that, well, the epigenetic marks have to be set up in the first place, but they will be set up during pregnancy or early childhood, and once they're set up, they have a kind of weak, a pretty lasting effect um, on your life. Again, if that's your kind of 
um, explanatory vision. If you just assume this um, is the explanatory story, of course, you won't be engaging in research that also investigates how kind of later um, aspects of the social environment um, um, in, impact epigenetic uh, processes. So um, to take stock in certain terms of a sort of intermediate um, result. Um, so what's going on is that the epigenetics of neuropsychiatry or behavioral epigenetics community um, is of diverse in terms of their kind of methodological and explanatory um, vision. I um, identify three pairs of uh, methodological stances. Um, um, so where the kind of um, left-hand side of each pair uh, promotes um, um, integration with our social environmental approach in the right hand side is rather disadvantageous um, uh, for this. That's a kind of bit schematic to be sure, um, but at least of it, um, it illustrates that actually you do get get some some substan you do already do have some steps substantial diversity within your overall uh, field. So to summarize, um, the options are kind of adopting a broader versus a more restrictive construal of epigenetic features to be taken into account by this um, research. Um, second, investigating the possibility of behavioral and psychotherapeutic treatments versus solely seeking pharmacological treatments. And third, um, investigating neuroplasticity in lifelong influences on brain processes, as opposed to assuming that prenatal and early childhood influences and um, program later uh, progression to behavioral uh, symptoms. Okay, and this brings me to the third and last part of my talk, the kind of normative um, uh, prong. So um, uh, my focus has been not so much on sort of integration as something that's already been achieved, but integration as an ongoing uh, process or something we can have more or less um, um, of. Uh, but this is in, in exactly in line with my kind of methodological orientation, uh, looking at methodological factors that either motivate or hamper uh, more integration of a certain uh, type. And remember, Longino, um, her skepticism about integration is a descriptive claim, but it still discourages um, integration. But now I kind of want to point to more normative reasons for more um, integration. And um, um, I do so by actually laying out even more pairs of um, methodological um, uh, stances, but of now with a kind of clear um, um, social political, uh, uh, or clear, let's say clear of social political uh, valence. But um, I'll get to it in a second, but I'll motivate it not by epigenetics and neuropsychiatry, but um, by uh, something else in the larger domain of human cognition uh, <laughs> research, namely the study of sex differences in um, uh, the brain. The main, um, the main theory you have there is the organizational activational um, hypothesis, which postulates that um, prenatal hormones organize um, um, brain regions in a dimorphic uh, uh, fashion. So sex hormones uh, lead to this dimorphic organization. And then later on, for instance, during puberty, sex hormones again play a role by kind of activating um, sex-specific uh, behaviors. Now, some of this um, research, um, for instance, done in uh, rodents, may be kind of restricted to um, specifically reproductive behavior, but you do have brain organization uh, theory, which also has sort of more controversial versions, which in the case of humans uh, claims the whole uh, suite of gender stereotypical behaviors and cognitive capacities, capacities in humans are rooted in sex hormone uh, differences, uh, verbal abilities, spatial reasoning and mathematical abilities, nurturing behavior, and uh, sexual um, orientations. Of course, there's been empirical criticism of these uh, claims. Um, I think you had Cordelia Fine here earlier this, this year. So she's one of the uh, critics she was um, here. And um, what's interesting is of, this is a quite active area of research despite the criticism, because um, research on um, race differences and cognition, that's sort of um, disreputable by now, but this is all fairly um, and, and active. And my impression is, at least of some of the researchers think, but well, in the case of um, sex differences, that you do have a real biological difference because you do have, have chromosomal and sex hormone um, differences. And that's why it's something scientific um, to it. 
okay, now let me um, first off just sketch um, these additional methodological stances, but um, I only but false, I will kind of illustrate them in this sort of larger domain on gender differences and um, uh, cognition. Um, so I, now the kind of left-hand side um, is not just facilitating integration, but integration that is desirable for social political reasons. So the first additional pair is on the one hand, you can investigate the variation among individuals, um, including variation within an analytic category, such as male and female. The very opposite is adopting what I call a typological stance by seeking to uncover a male and female uh, condition representing findings in these terms. And the last um, pairs, on the one hand, you can investigate the interplay of more biological, more social factors and brain processes, as opposed to revealing, in fact, literally adopting a nature nurture dichotomy by attempting to reveal an alleged pure, pure um, and biology. Okay, let's mention some examples um, uh, for this. So when it comes to the kind of earlier pair, um, the kind of right-hand side, um, good examples are the psychologist Baron Cohen or the neuropsychiatrist Luen Brizendine. Um, both of them talk about the female brain and the male um, 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 uh, brain. And um, Baron Cohen actually acknowledges that well, not every female has a female brain, not every, uh, not every woman has a female brain, not every man has a male brain, but he still continues talking about this, if this sort of weak fight um, category was, uh, was somehow kind of scientifically more interesting or real than kind of the actual um, humans and their kind of particular distinctive cognitive um, um, uh, traits. I mean, others um, certainly won't talk about the female brain, but they're still interested in uh, representing finding this kind of more interested in finding sex differences rather than chartering the variation within um, uh, such a kind of analytic uh, category. On the um, opposite end, um, something you could of um, associate with the opposite end is neuroscientist Daphna Joel's uh, mosaic brain hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, she points out that finding more and more individual cognitive or neurophysiological traits that um, uh, that are either more common in men or more common in women actually doesn't uh, lend stronger and stronger support to the male and female brain um, uh, vision, because it's very well possible that most persons can still be a mosaic of traits that are kind of more common among men, but also other cognitive, individual cognitive traits that are more, more, um, um, more common in uh, women. And she makes an empirical case that this is a case, there have been, has been empirical criticism um, of the mosaic brain hypothesis. I'm not interested in this as an empirical um, hypothesis. Yeah. So I'm, I'm one of the few sort of speaking um, to an HBS called saying I'm not interested in empirical, empirical matters. And um, instead my focus is on um, methodology. I mean, certainly um, um, I, you can use it as a kind of methodological uh, vision, kind of what we should, um, what, what kind of we should um, study variation and we should um, investigate many individual traits and charter the kind of complex distributions between uh, cognitive um, uh, traits. So as a kind of methodological um, agenda, it's sort of opposite to trying to uncover kind of male and female uh, brain type. Getting to the last bits of nature nurture uh, dichotomy. So in this still domain, um, some people who don't adopt the nature nurture dichotomy. So kind of one interesting um, case is so those researchers um, who um, use the construct sex slash gender or gender slash um, uh, uh, sex. Um, uh, the point being that while there, there are kind of research contexts where, you, where it's not possible or not easy to distinguish sex, and um, gender because you have a kind of complex um, mutual influence of kind of more biological and social features related to kind of gender cognition and behavior. So that's why they use that uh, construct. So they're kind of researchers already kind of open to inter um, investigating the interplay of biological and social features. On the other hand, you have um, people who um, um, assume that you do have a kind of primary biological stratum that's not just there uninfluenced by socialization in even the case of human uh, behavior. And so of socialization is of just a kind of secondary, um, secondary builds on this biological stratum and that you can still re reveal kind of pure biology if you just kind of um, um, subtract um, the social environmental um, influences. And something that may sort of 
create biases towards the nature uh, nurture dichotomy um, maybe sort of brain scans because if you see um, um, differences for instance gender differences well it, it's inside the brain you kind of more likely to assume that well it's due to nature rather than um, nurture even though of course social environmental influence must have impact on physiological or show up in physiological neurophysiological processes somehow likewise um, the reliance on rodent um, models said it may be easier to assume that while social factors don't kind of play an important um, role or you may kind of forget that case of model organism which you're dealing with uh, with um, 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 lab uh, uh, strains where you kind of uh, strictly control the in, um, environments so as to kind of um, reduce environmental uh, variation. Um, more importantly, from my uh, perspective, something like kind of nature nurture dichotomy can also kind of reinforce the above um, typological stance in that you kind of may assume, look, we can talk about a female and main brain, male brain because that's given by um, um, nature. Of course, there's kind of variation. Um, uh, between such a kind of a, a category, but that's due to a separate factor like um, like a socialization. Uh, but we, as sort of hard nosed bio biologically minded scientists, are only interested in the uh, biology. Okay, um, let's now it's time to kind of look at um, neuropsychiatry and epigenetics um, research. So when it Given that the topic is now is sort of has shifted towards um, gender, I mean, generally known there are gender differences in the prevalence of many psychiatric conditions, for instance, autism and schizophrenia, it's more common in men, um, major depression, more common in uh, women, and even the onset and expression of these conditions uh, uh, can be uh, gendered. Um, needless to say, um, the general psychiatry researchers don't necessarily assume that it's just due to kind of um, biological sex um, differences, but kind of stereotypical behaviors. It can in influence kind of uh, like kind of a condition like OCD um, and its expression on the incidence, or uh, likewise um, can impact um, mood and emotion regulation um, um, strategies. Um, but what about um, um, epigenetics? research as of clearly molecular approach when it um, discusses gender differences in the context of neural um, psychiatry. Again, um, the picture is mixed. You, you find um, you've, among sort of the pairs, you, you, find, you find all opposing uh, stands or that's kind of um, rough, all, all rival uh, pairs. So on the kind of one hand, you have researchers that indicate that uh, there's a gender bias uh, uh, in epigenetic features, but they kind of highlight and um, that is a kind of a quite significant sex overlap in epigenetic profiles. So they don't break things down in kind of male or female epigenetic um, uh, profile. So they're not adopting a typological stance. And uh, started some studies at least um, need not be committed to the gender effect that we see, including um, gender differences in epigenetic features being genetic or um, biological. Researchers um, may very well um, um, indicate that sex hormone play a causal um, role, but unlike the um, brain organization theory, sex hormones um, are sometimes not seen as sort of sort of linear drivers that would create one or the other um, developmental dimorphic strategy. Instead, you have a lot of, at least you have a lot of modulating talk. So some view kind of um, sex hormones more like as a collateral factor that modulates epigenetic mechanisms and psychosocially caused uh, traits. Um, but let's look at alternative um, alternative uh, visions. Um, I previously already kind of mentioned, indicated that you have a, this di um, a programming deterministic discourse in epigenetics. Sarah Richardson, one of the person who has noted it, and of course she's only connected up with considerations about agenda. So kind of one point she makes is that even though this sort of new epigenetics research is not about, about single genes or some simple causal factors, it's about kind of complex and internet than um, action networks. But now some regional assume or, uh, uh, or portray a vision where you have an interaction interaction networks that spans the whole. Um, body, but that's um, gendered and ultimately um, um, uh, sex. And even though um, researchers 
could um, investigate how, for instance, uh, the human social environment or kind of stereotypical behaviors creates kind of variation because of um, epigenetic uh, plasticity. There are at least are some in the field who are primarily interested in understanding um, um, sex specific epigenetic. Um, uh, so epigenetic plasticity is also now viewed as um, I don't dimorphic. So kind of many papers um, talking about sex specific epigenetic um, uh, responses. And the quote I have on here, I have on here um, by McCarthy and Arnold, um, it's, it's on there because Sarah uh, Richardson in a kind of overall critical paper points to them as a kind of positive an example, but Sarah actually overlooks that even these scientists talk about sex-specific epigenetic programming, which is of ultimately Sarah Richardson's um, um, uh, target. So um, more commonly in research that kind of relies on animal model approaches to kind of shed light on human neuropsychiatric um, uh, conditions, um, you, you find research that uses epigenetic findings but use a kind of male female typology. So, one example here is this uh, paper by McCarthy and um, a co authors. Um, so, they're um, so they kind of motivate the relevance for epigenetics um, research by um, um, having kind of a really nice list of neuropsychiatric conditions that show some gender um, at, at differences. However, when it comes to um, um, uh, presenting results or developing explanatory uh, frameworks. Ultimately, they're kind of interested in just um, um, uncovering sex uh, differences. And you see this from this uh, image. Epigenetics is, in, is sort of involved up here, methylation, um, but it's sort of broken down a kind of male and female condition. And you do, at the end, you do get sex specific adult um, 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 behaviors. And even though this is sort of just a kind of um, sketchy, um, a basic um, diagram, research like theirs is of still kind of thinking um, in these terms of the primary um, and outputs you want to uh, result um, the researchers are trying to get out of their um, molecular epigenetic um, research. And these research also um, adopt a sort of nature nurture dichotomy because they clearly acknowledge that social gender plays a role in humans, um, but they view it as a, a, con a confounder. Um, that's something that of distorts results uh, while their agenda is to, uh, um, um, is to recover the kind of biological contribution on sex differences, again, falsely assuming you had some sort of pure biological contribution that wouldn't be unaffected by any behavioral or social environmental um, uh, features. Okay, let me come. Conclude. Yeah, so kind of the overall plot has been that in the epigenetics of neuropsychiatry community, we have a diversity of methodological stances, um, including these um, um, last two. And my um, contention is uh, the, the left hand side of the last one. Um, so investigating variation and investigating the interplay of more biological, more social factors. Doing this um, um, doesn't just um, enable integration with kind of more uh, social environmental approaches and also leads to kind of um, richer um, scientific finds, richer um, explanations. But of course, it also um, is integration of is societal for social political um, reasons, because unless you kind of investigate variation with these categories, the alternative certainly of a typological stuff just kind of reinforces um, uh, gender stereotypes we have. And if you don't investigate the um, underlying causes of um, the variation, you also kind of miss um, the social environmental um, um, uh, factors that play a role in generating this variation as, um, as well. And um, in that um, domain, um, you do have um, a, a scientist, actual um, scientists who kind of claim that sort of social patterns and gender differences are um, largely uh, biological. It includes um, 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 uh, Simon Baron Cohen, Luan Brizendine, which I've mentioned so uh, uh, previously, but also the psychologist um, uh, Susan Pinker. So they um, directly talk about, uh, for instance, the, um, the uh, gender gap in 
math and science or STEM fields more generally. And their line is, look, this is sort of largely due to um, um, biology, due to brain um, organization. So can, even though they don't justify or um, I condone these um, social differences, of course, adopting this um, um, alleged explanatory um, uh, account, of course, makes um, social reforms completely, um, completely, um, <clears throat> completely moot. And um, even though my focus has been on gender discrimination, which can have effects on bodily features, including neurophysiological uh, features, racism is, of course, an um, uh, even more obvious um, a case in point. For instance, Jonathan Kaplan, in a nice um, uh, paper, has of pointed, is of discussing um, race based medicine, like kind of the heart medication. Um, uh, Biden, his point is that even if this race based medicine is um, effective, it doesn't mean that the differences are um, um, genetic or kind of biological in a kind of a narrow um, a sense, because social patterns like racism can create health disparities, it can create differential um, physiologies, and then um, these drugs uh, take effect. And of course, this line is once you, um, um, once you know this, we shouldn't just of uh, treat it as kind of medical issues be solved by, by drugs. But once uh, you know this um, irrelevant social pattern is based on racism, you kind of should also fight um, uh, racism. And in my case as well, we shouldn't view kind of mental health just a kind of purely medical um, issue, but have to be effectively to kind of prevent and have prevention strategy or have social means to either improve human health or kind of um, reduce um, in, inequities that we see in the case of mental um, health. So that's certainly something that you should um, strive for. And of course, um, to do so, you kind of need knowledge about, um, among other things, how kind of human social environmental conditions create these kind of mental health um, uh, disparities. So what this means is for these um, social political um, uh, reasons, um, preventing mental health, reducing inequities, um, even if you are kind of a sort of hard-nosed um, epigenetics researcher as a, sort of, as a, as a molecular uh, biologist, it would be desirable to have more integration of this molecular neuroscientific research and kind of more psychological, sociological uh, perspectives. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So as we always do, we'll take a few minutes break, five minutes maximum, so that if you need to go teach, you can actually uh, leave the room. And then uh, for those of you who are new, the way we ask questions is that you um, uh, should at the beginning of when we meet, raise your hand and make a list, and then I will call on you one after, one after the other, all right? Give me five minutes. No. Okay, so I'll, I'll check that out in the back. And then we can move on. Somewhere in the first year, I'm going to get out. And then we're trying to come in. 